SMS Goben was a Moltke-class battlecruiser of the Imperial German Navy, and later the Ottoman Navy, and then the Turkish Navy. Yeah, it's a bit complicated, uh, so a bit more than five minutes here. Goben started life as a Moltke-class battlecruiser in service to Imperial Germany. Uh, for details on the ship's armament and its other technical capabilities, there is a video on the Moltke-class in general. The Moltke class were the second German battlecruisers to be designed, uh, but it would not be until the Der Flinger class, the fourth design, uh, that Germany would ever operate battlecruisers of the same class together. This is because her story is nearly unique in history, let alone in the history of the German Navy. The Goben was completed in July 1912 and had only spent three months in active service before the outbreak of the First Balkan War meant German High Command decided that Germany needed an active naval presence in the Mediterranean in order to exert their growing power in this area. Therefore, in company with the cruiser Breslau, the Goben was sent to cruise around various parts of the Adriatic Sea, basing itself out of the port of Pola, which belonged to the friendly Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time. Effectively, the ship's job was to sail around saying, look at me, I'm big and shiny and powerful, and if you annoy me, I have a lot of explosives on board which I will deliver to you at exceptionally high velocity. So don't mess with me, or the country whose flag I'm flying. This seemed to go relatively well, and when the Second Balkan War broke out, the ships were kept in the area, repeating the job, and ironically at the same time demonstrating which partner was the superior ally, since Goben far outclassed anything the Austro-Hungarian Navy had in service at the time, with the possible exception of the togethoff class dreadnoughts that were only just starting to come into service. The Germans planned to bring her home and replace her with the Moltke, but the circumstances surrounding the outbreak of the First World War made this impossible, even though the ship's engines desperately needed repairs, and so engineers had to be sent from Germany to Pola to replace most of the inner workings of the ship's boilers. With speed restored, and perfectly aware that war was about to break out, and the ship could therefore be trapped in the Adriatic Sea, the ship made for the port of Messina, where it should allow it to go pretty much anywhere in the Mediterranean if the need arose. War broke out in stages, and initially the ship attacked French shipping and positions in the western Mediterranean. But the Germans could see where things were headed, and ordered Goben and Breslau to head for the Ottoman Empire as soon as possible. Turning back to Messina for coal, they came across the British battlecruisers indefatigable and indomitable. Germany was not yet at war with Britain, and so the two sides merely exchanged steely glances as they slipped past each other, and the British rather unsubtly did a 180-degree turn and started to follow the German ships. With its own partially refreshed engines, the Goben proved the faster vessel and outran the British, who were suffering from their own engine troubles, but would now be delayed refuelling in port whilst a third British battlecruiser, the Inflexible, which was fueling up elsewhere and about to join the chase. It should be noted at this point that the declaration of war between Britain and Germany happened only hours after the two sides had first crossed paths, so this was an incredibly lucky escape. At this point, there were three battlecruisers, four armoured cruisers, and over a dozen light cruisers and destroyers all waiting for the Goben to make the wrong move. However, luck stayed with the ship. Due to a series of miscommunications and misjudgments, the armoured cruisers broke off pursuit hours before they could have engaged, and the other ships mostly tried to block Goben and Breslau from re-entering the Adriatic Sea. But of course, the ships weren't going there, and by the time anyone had figured this out, Goben was halfway to Turkey. But this wasn't the end of things. Technically, the Ottoman Empire was still neutral, and negotiations began for entry through the Dardanelles Straits. And now every British ship in the Mediterranean, and even some of the French, were pouring after them as fast as possible. The ship finally got clearance to proceed, just as the smoke from the pursuing British battlecruisers came over the horizon. Let's take a quick look at a summary of what it must have been like in those exciting few days on the approach to the Dardanelles. Due to the slight issue of the Ottomans still being officially neutral, the ships were supposedly sold to the Ottoman Navy. 
if by sail you mean they had the same crew, the same commander, fought the same enemies, and the ship's admiral was now made a commander of the Ottoman navy. Basically, they changed the flag, and that was about it. Well, that, and they also changed the name. The Goban became the Yavut Sultan Selim, and the Breslau was renamed Midili. And everyone got to get wear a fez, so I guess there were some happy endings to life after all. Well, not quite for this crew. Shortly afterwards, the Ottomans joined the war on the German side anyway, and the Yavuts now spent its time harassing the Russians. However, despite the Black Sea Fleet only having pre-dreadnoughts, the Russians had practiced coordinating all their ships together to try and make up for individual inferiority, and this led to an inconclusive engagement with damage to both sides. Although, given that it was the entire Black Sea Fleet against the Yavuts, this is probably a technical win for the not-German ship. But hitting two mines in separate incidents in later 1914 seemed to indicate that the ship's luck was beginning to run out. 1915 was somewhat inconclusive. Another engagement with Russian battleships, numerous escort missions, and a brief attempt at interfering with the Gallipoli landings didn't add up to too much, with the latter attempt being driven off by the 15-inch guns of HMS Queen Elizabeth. At the end of the year, the Russians completed two dreadnought battleships, which further boxed the ship in in terms of its freedom of operation. 1916 and 1917 continued this trend, with the main operation of note being an engagement with one of the Russian dreadnoughts that was again inconclusive, but the ship was being worn down by constant use, little to no repair, and a lack of coal. From the earlier video on the Greek cruiser Averoff and the German Brandenburg class of pre-dreadnoughts, you might be starting to recognise these as occupational hazards of being part of the Ottoman navy. However, this enforced lack of use meant that the German crew fixed up what they could, and with the Russians dropping out of the war by 1918, the ship was reasonably operational again. Operations started well, sinking the British monitors Raglan and M28 in a surprise attack, and finding a British pre-dreadnought raising steam alone nearby. But then everything went wrong. The Express Law struck a number of mines and sank. Yavuz also struck three mines and had to be beached, whereupon it was bombed and shelled repeatedly, just escaping before a British submarine arrived to finish the job, thanks to a tow from a Turkish pre-dreadnought that hadn't quite managed to break down just yet. After extensive repairs and some operations surrounding the final Russian surrender, the ship almost ended up in Allied hands as part of the treaty between the Ottomans and the Allies at the end of the war. However, the revolution that destroyed the Ottoman Empire and founded the modern state of Turkey scrapped that treaty, and the ship would remain in Turkish hands. A long and confused series of events vaguely directed at repairing the ship now occurred, but she was still unfit for duty in 1928, when the Greek navy conducted a large-scale exercise off the Turkish coast. Suddenly motivated, the ship was refitted and ready for service by 1930, with her name shortened to Yavut Sultan. Although her armour was not updated and she would be vulnerable to long-range plunging fire, the Turkish Navy planned to keep her in service until 1945, when she would be replaced by another similar-sized ship, but the outbreak of World War II meant that all the shipyards Turkey had ordered ships from were now unable to fulfil the orders, a somewhat ironic situation given that exactly the same thing had happened in the First World War. As a result, she stayed in service and would meet the USS Missouri on an official visit to Turkey in 1946, before being decommissioned from active duty in 1950. However, for a brief period between 1952 and 1954, she was technically part of the NATO reserve fleet. In 1963, the Turkish government offered to sell her back to West Germany as a museum ship, but the offer was declined. Sadly, therefore, despite being the lone remaining dreadnought warship outside the United States, she was scrapped in the mid-1970s. Ironically, for a ship that was barely in German service for a few years, her lifespan was almost half again greater than the total lifespan of Imperial Germany, the state that had created her.